everyone, and welcome to ShareHR's 2016 HR Trends webinar. My name is Ashley, and for those of you who are not familiar with GoToWebinar, I'm going to give you a brief overview. First, you should notice a GoToWebinar taskbar on your main monitor screen. It should be noted that the audience will be muted for the duration of the webinar. Should you have any questions for our panelists during the presentation, please use the question chat pane located on your GoToWebinar taskbar, and please be sure to include your telephone number. If time allows, we will field several of the questions, or we will follow up with you promptly. You should also use this question and chat pane if you experience any technical difficulties. We will be recording this webinar. For those of you interested in obtaining a copy of the presentation afterwards, please make a request in the chat pane, or please contact our offices directly. Shared HR's contact information, as well as Paul, Amy, Michelle, and Deborah's, will be provided at the completion of the webinar. Also, we have included information on both Shared HR and police at the end of the presentation. The multitude of recently passed laws, regulations, and even municipal ordinances make staying on top of HR compliance increasingly complex. Shared HR works with hundreds of employers each year to help them maintain compliance. Our team has identified the following key trends that are likely to impact employers in 2016. Cybersecurity, ACA update and compliance, NLRB activities, evolving independent contractor rules, and HR compliance past and present. Our first presenter will be Paul Finkel, CEO of Shared HR. Paul has more than 30 years experience in the human resources and management consulting. He's worked with more than 1,000 Excuse me, he's worked with more than a thousand employers practicing areas that include incentive compensation, organization and staffing planning, assessments, and connecting people to strategy. He's founded 10 startup businesses and has been a lecturer at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Paul is a certified management consultant as well as a senior professional in human resources. <clears throat> now I'd like to turn the floor over to Paul. Thank you, Ashley. Mm -hmm. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Amy Kellerman of our staff. Uh, Amy possesses a deep HR management uh, experience and background, uh, specifically working with mid-size and startup organizations. Her areas of expertise include employee relations, interim HR management, compensation, technology, benefits, and HR compliance. Over the past 20 years, Amy's conducted numerous workplace investigations, and successfully responded to complaints of discrimination, harassment, wrongful termination. She's been with Chair HR for the past four plus years. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Michelle Montoya. Uh, she is the COO and Director of Compliance for Felice. Uh, Michelle leads the compliance team at Felice Insurance. In this role, she manages a team of human resources consultants who provide guidance and support to Felice clients when they have issues related to areas such as employee communication and relations, federal and state employment regulations, and benefit plan compliance. Michelle has been with police insurance for 13 years. Uh, another one of our presenters is also from Felice. Deborah Hyde is an ERISA counsel, an ERISA attorney uh, who's on the Felice compliance team. As a member of this team, she provides in-depth analysis of benefit laws, regulations, ensuring clients are able to effectively meet the challenges of the ever-evolving legal landscape without sacrificing the success of their benefit plans. So all of us have teamed up today to address um, the 2016 trends. But before we jump into those trends, we want to give you just a bit of our overall philosophy. Uh, and that philosophy really is that employers need to have, kind of think of HR as having both an offensive and defensive strategy. On the defense, defensive side of the field, uh, it's really all about uh, protecting the organization. Employers are facing increasing employment liability these days. Uh, the compliance requirements are becoming extremely complex, and we'll be dealing with several of those in today's presentation. Um, and HR is also becoming much more technical and data-driven. Um, on the offensive side of what HR is supposed to be doing, um, it has to answer questions like, what's the plan to acquire and develop top talent? How do we ensure that we're engaging our key players so they'll continue to stay and add value? Um, 
this is the part of HR's role that's really about supporting business strategy. Um, and it's with this sort of philosophy and backdrop uh, that we want to address uh, what we have identified as um, a series of important HR trends that will affect all of us in 2016. So if we could go to the next slide, the first uh, trend really is cybersecurity. Um, so let's begin there. Um, if we can go to the next slide, Ashley, cyber um, security really has to do um, with some HR-related threats. Now, as you first looked at this webinar, you might have said, well, wait a minute, you know, is cybersecurity really an HR problem? Um, and we think that, in fact, it is an HR problem, and it will become part of the new reality in 2016. And the reason is that more and more companies are converting their personnel files to digital files, uh, basically online personnel files. And if you think about that for a moment, um, if you're an identity thief or a hacker, uh, you've got a treasure trove of information there, everything from social security numbers to uh, contact information to, to medical files. So online data is making business more efficient, but at the same time, uh, it's creating a new set of risks that actually impact HR and that HR has to pay attention to. And in fact, there are several examples of where these types of breaches are already happening. Uh, there's a lot that's been said in the news recently about this Ashley Madison breach, uh, and that was the Toronto-based uh, website uh, where insiders essentially left the organization, hacked in, and uh, tried to blackmail the organization by saying they were going to release uh, information on its members who were supposed to be private. Uh, these were uh, married individuals who said that they um, wanted to have an affair. So it was highly um, charged information. They tried to blackmail uh, the organization. The organization wouldn't pay the money and they released the information. Um, it was a very large enterprise. The CEO had to step down um, and it just shows what an inside person um, it can do with a series of passwords. Uh, earlier this year, Adobe had uh, 153 million users and passwords stolen. Um, that was a, one of the largest breaches ever, um, and I am not particularly thrilled to report that uh, my username and password were part of, was part of that. Um, and I'll tell you how I found out about that in just a minute. Um, the wine industry is another one. For those of you that are on any wine lists, you may have heard about um, a rather famous data breach of contact information uh, and phone numbers and all sorts of email information and passwords that were, uh, as well as credit card information, that were breached in a series of wineries who all use the same um, information or same uh, vendor uh, for uh, e-trading and transactions. Um, and one of our clients we worked with closely in, during this breach um, called in a security expert who looked at their uh, systems and said, well, you know, there's only two kinds of employers left out there. Um, those that have been breached and know it and those that have been breached and don't know it. So I'm not sure that it's quite that bad yet uh, but it's going to get that way. And the problem with it is that you don't hear about these cases. They're very much like employment cases where they're quietly settled behind the scenes, uh, but information's out there. So uh, if you're an HR person or, or you're teaming up with your IT group, what do you do? Well, on a personal basis, you can check the following link that we have provided you, which is this have been pwned. And this, you know, P-W-N-E-D uh, is sort of a hacker term that says essentially you've, your identity's been stolen or your password's been stolen. You're now kind of owned. Um, and when I checked this website, that's how I learned I was part of the Adobe uh, user and password um, 
postponing uh, situation. Now, you can go to the same website, and if, with proper corporate authentication, you can check whether your corporate site has also been hacked in some way. So this is a very useful website uh, to find out if this happened. But there are people out there trying to do this all the time. And if you're an organization that's not particularly technical or not in the technology industry, uh, you may not have appropriate security. Now can we move to the next slide? Um, so the next thing you need to do is to prevent some issues. First, you should check with your property and casualty broker to confirm you've got appropriate cyber coverage. There is type, uh, type of liability coverage, particularly if you have any kind of a website or your technology field where you can buy insurance for these types of breaches. Um, and there are, for those of you who have never been through this, there are tremendous expenses associated with these breaches uh, because you have to contact people who have been uh, impacted by this and there's a lot of management time as well as potentially other liability, depending on the kind of information you have. Next, you should um, conduct or at least extend a cyber assessment into your in, to include uh, HR issues. For example, um, this year many of our clients started providing company phones or at least paying for some of their employees' company phones as a result of a series of court cases. Um, if you're issuing company phones, you know what information is on there? Do you have any limitations about uh, personal information versus company information? And do you have challenges with respect to access? For example, do you have the right to access text messages that may contain company information? <clears throat> Pardon me. Can you show that you've got some kind of corporate cybersecurity plan where you've talked about these issues so if a breach happens and there is some kind of litigation, you can at least show good faith that you've tried to develop security against some of these issues. Next thing you could do is um, review the security of your digital files. Who's got access? Are there limits on these accesses? And can you trace the history? And I'll get to some examples of that in a moment. And then review your offboarding policies um, so that you make sure that you're um, changing passwords, that you're getting information back, that you have the right kinds of checklists, um, and that these checklists are associated with personnel files. Um, one of the, the systems we're now recommending to clients is Citrix or Box, where you can have a third-party uh, cloud-based repository for files with appropriate passwords and securities. RIT guys like Citrix way better than Box, but there are a number of secure platforms. Some of our clients use one called Sooner and some others out there. These platforms allow you to secure things like personnel files and trace uh, footprints if anyone goes in and downloads them. Um, do you have appropriate security protection on your personnel files if you don't use one of these platforms? Um, if you're just using Microsoft SharePoint, for example, uh, there are certain basic uh, passwords you can protect things, but we consider that to be fairly inadequate. Then considering issue, issuing something like Dashlane or LastPass to your employees where you can actually securely on, provide an online vault for passwords. And then there's a series of other publications that are available by the uh, FFC. Can you go back to the slide one second, please? Um, there's a link that we're going to provide you here uh, that says, you know, this tiny URL gives you a 10 tips on cyber security for small business. Now we can go to the next slide because there's some penalties that you need to think about. Uh, you know, any company can face these issues, but if you're in California and your breach impacts over 500 California residents, and that could be former employees, ex current employees, uh, what have you, you must report the breach to the Attorney General. Uh, there could be some privacy litigation if you have been hacked for people's private data. Um, there could be a loss of corporate secrets and other information based on the breach. Um, and you know the 
The HR piece of this is if the breach comes from an inside job because someone's password wasn't taken away, um, it really is going to focus a very negative light on the company and the HR. And ultimately, uh, there's a huge management time loss involved in these kinds of cases. So when we were preparing this webinar, uh, Michelle brought up a very interesting point, which is that a number of employers, uh, at least they, uh, in the Felice uh, client base, are now offering for their employees some identity theft protection, such that if any uh, the, an employee's identity was stolen, whether it was through a commercial transaction uh, or however it got stolen, they would have some kind of identity theft protection as kind of like an employee benefit. Um, so just last week, uh, my corporate card was um, stolen, and it was shut down by the vendor. And the person, the security person I talked to, said, "You're never supposed to put your credit card now in a um, in an attendantless gas station pump, because someone could come after you and have a reader." And she, that's how they believe that card was stolen. So this whole identity theft and cybersecurity issue is going to be something that's going to be with us for a while and it does have its tentacles in HR. So we consider that to be one of the important uh, trends uh, for 2016. Next, I'd like to uh, turn the floor over to Deborah to talk about the ACA update and compliance. OK, thank you, Paul. So of no surprise to anyone, there are a lot of ACA-related updates and changes that employers need to keep an eye on going into 2016, and this is particularly relevant to mid-size employers. So right off the bat in 2016 is mid-size employer compliance with the employer shared responsibility provision of the ACA. So we know that in 2015, transition relief was provided to mid-size employers, and those are employers with between 50 and 99 full-time and full-time equivalent employees and that transition relief allowed these employers to delay compliance with the employer mandate or the employer shared responsibility provisions um, until 2016. So that transition relief expires in 2016. So that means that mid-sized employers are going to have to come into compliance with the employer shared responsibility provisions no later than January 1st, 2016, or if the employer maintains a non-calendar year plan they will have to come into compliance no later than the first date of the 2016 plan year. So what exactly does compliance with the employer shared responsibility provisions entail? So there are two main components to these provisions. The first is that as a, an employer subject to this mandate, uh, the employer must offer minimum essential coverage to at least 95% of their full-time employees and dependents in 2016. So in 2015, right now, currently, that threshold is lower. That threshold is at 70% of full-time employees. But starting in 2016, um, it's going to go up to 95%. So that's the target threshold that mid-size employers need to be focusing on now. The other component to the employer shared responsibility provisions is that the coverage that is provided must provide minimum value to the employee and must also be affordable to the employee. And minimum value and affordability are two concepts that are more clearly defined in the law. Um, so employers will need to analyze those a little bit more closely to make sure that their plan that they're currently offering, that they plan to offer in 2016, actually meets both minimum value and affordability. So if an employer fails to comply with these two components of the mandate, there are potential penalties at play. And those penalties um, are triggered when a full-time employee was either not offered coverage or was not offered minimum value or affordable coverage. And that employee goes to an exchange and qualifies for a tax credit or a subsidy. So for uh, mid-sized employers, really right now is the time to be focusing on bringing uh, medical plans and health plans into compliance with the employer mandate um, for 2016. Another development in 2016 that will directly impact mid-sized employers um, is the expanded definition of a small group employer. So 
we can move to the next slide. We'll take a look at that one. So under the ACA, the definition of a small employer was set to expand from an employer with 1 to 50 employees to one with 1 to 100 employees, and that was going to be effective as of January 2016. However, on October 7, uh, 2015, so just a few weeks ago, the PACE Act was signed into law, and the PACE Act repeals this expanded definition of a small group employer. And so this is important because that means that employers with 51 to 100 employees, so those mid-sized employers, will be able to remain in the large group insurance market and will not have to um, be squeezed into the small group insurance market starting in 2016. So that's um, an important development for mid-sized employers. However, for California employers, um, it's a little bit different picture uh, because California law is now at odds with federal law following that repeal. And that is because in 2012, California actually enacted its own legislation that expanded its definition of a small group employer to an employer with 1 to 100 employees. And this was done to align California law with federal law. So unless California amends or repeals its expanded definition, California employers with 51 to 100 employees will transition into the small group market as of January 1st, 2016. And this is going to impact uh, fully insured, non-grandfathered health plans. So if you happen to be a mid-sized employer with a grandfathered health plan, or if you happen to self-insure your health plan, this will not impact you. But for the large majority of mid-sized employers in California, they will have to begin this transition, and that will be taking effect in 2016. Excuse me, Deborah, do you think that there's much hope of that changing between now and the end of the year? Um, in California, you know, we're, we're going into November, um, so there are really only two months left for that change to take place. The governor has actually um, signed all of the laws that he's going to sign for 2015, um, which means that for this repeal, for this to be repealed, excuse me, or amended, it would require, um, you know, some last minute, almost emergency type legislation, which is unlikely to occur in my opinion. Um, but we'll have to stay tuned to see what plays out in this last quarter of the year. Okay, thanks. Okay, so let's take the heat off of mid-sized employers for a few minutes here, and let's look at something that impacts all large employers and even some smaller employers too. So if we move ahead to IRS reporting under Section 6055 and 6056, We've all heard a lot about ACA reporting. Um, we know that applicable large employers, those are the employers with 50 or more full-time and full-time equivalent employees, are subject to this reporting requirement under Section 6056. And I want to point out that this includes those mid-sized employers with 50 to 99 employees who are delaying compliance until next year. Uh, those employers remain subject to this reporting requirement. So for large employers, um, they will be reporting under Section 6056 using Forms 1094 and 1095C. Uh, AC reporting, however, also applies to some small employers, and these will be employers with fewer than 50 full-time and full-time equivalent employees, um, and these are employers who maintain a self-insured medical plan. So if you're a small employer, and your uh, medical plan is not fully insured, you self-fund that medical plan, then you are also subject to reporting requirements under Section 6055. And that means that you will have to submit reports to the IRS using Forms 1094 and 1095B. So in other words, the only employers who are not subject um, to this reporting are going to be small employers that sponsor a fully insured medical plan. This is the first time that this requirement is being uh, is actually a requirement. It was voluntary in the previous year, and I don't know of any employer that decided to do it voluntarily. So we're looking at 2016 being the first due date for these reports, and those due dates are um, going to be the end of February, so February 28th, 
or March 31st of 2016 if you file those forms electronically with the IRS. And then the other deadline you're going to be looking at is a little bit earlier, and that deadline is January 31st. And that is the date by, wit, by when you have to uh, distribute the employee statement to your employees. So you've got two different deadlines going on. You've got two different types of forms going on. It can get a little complicated. So for that reason, many employers are turning to a third party to handle uh, the reporting obligation. So many employers have a vendor in place already who will be handling these reporting obligations for them. Uh, but still, there are plenty of employers out there who are still looking for a vendor to take care of this reporting for them. So if you are looking for a vendor and you're um, you know, out there kind of shopping around, there are several considerations to keep in mind. So the first is what kind of system and what kind of service do you want? Do you want a robust system that will um, offer you multiple services beyond reporting, such as perhaps online enrollment, um, tracking of employees and employee eligibility, as well as reporting, or do you just need a standalone reporting service, one that will just do the bare minimum of populating the forms and filing those forms with the IRS? It's important to um, distinguish the services that you need and the services that are being offered. Uh, on that note is how well, or if at all, does the system integrate with your existing payroll or benefits administration system? So does this service or this system integrate with the payroll or benefits admin that you currently have? And if it doesn't, what level of manual data collection is going to be required of you? So this vendor is going to somehow have to get all of your data and all of the information in order to populate the forms. So is that going to come from an integrated service with your payroll, or is that going to be something that you will have to manually collect and then turn over to that vendor? Um, so that's just another thing to keep in mind. Of course, when you're looking at any sort of service, you need to take a look at any hidden fees or gaps in service that's being provided. A really common one that I've observed with uh, reporting vendors is e-filing, so electronic filing. They will often charge an additional fee to file the forms electronically with the IRS, and they may also charge an additional fee uh, to distribute the employee statements to your employees. So you need to be sure that you know what the vendor is going to do for you and what you will be responsible for or have to pay an additional fee for. And then finally, kind of along with uh, Paul's prior topic of cybersecurity is the issue of security and data storage. So how long will that data be stored by the vendor and then what kind of security measures does that vendor take to ensure that the information and the data you provide is going to be kept um, secure and, and not um, vulnerable to breaches. <clears throat> Excuse me. The alternative to outsourcing reporting to a vendor, of course, is to handle the reporting in-house on your own. And this is certainly a viable solution for many employers, especially for the small employers. Um, but if you are going to tackle reporting on your own, your first priority <clears throat> excuse me, should be to ensure accurate completion of Form 1095B or C. So the Form 1095 is the one that you're going to have to fill out for every single full-time employee uh, or covered individual on your plan. So you're going to be filling out multiples of these forms. And they do contain some detailed monthly information. So you want to make sure that your first priority is this 1095 form. And you will have to, at a minimum, identify your full-time employees in each month. And you're going to have to keep track of the type of coverage that was offered to the employee that month, the cost of the coverage that you offered, and then, of course, the enrollment status, whether or not that employee uh, chose to enroll or chose to waive the coverage that you offered. <clears throat> Deborah, if I could jump in, this is Paul yeah, for one yeah, second. Uh, we've we received information from several vendors uh, in your prior section that are saying they do not intend to take any new clients after the end of November. Uh, so yeah. if you haven't selected a vendor yet, this is a red hot priority uh, unless you want to do the in-house reporting yourself, which, as Deborah just said, is quite complex. So. Um, I just want to bring that up that this is yeah. not something you should wait on. 
No, you. that's an excellent point and it's an important one. I actually, you say the end of November, I actually have several in mind who have made um, October 31st the cutoff. So if you're still wanting to find a vendor and you just haven't done that yet, I mean, this is absolute uh, urgency here that you need to find someone. Um, and of course, don't just settle and, and take whoever comes by, but you know, make an informed decision, but make sure that you're making it pretty quickly um, because Paul is right that those deadlines are coming up. Okay, um, moving on to um, a different, perhaps more positive topic, but perhaps not, is the Cadillac tax. And that is actually one that is not going to be affecting anyone in 2016. It will not be affecting anyone until 2018. But 2016 is a good year to start thinking about the Cadillac tax. Um, the Cadillac tax, of course, is the Affordable Care Act excise tax on high-cost employer-sponsored health plans. And this tax will apply to both insured and self-insured health plans. Again, that's beginning in January of 2018. So you may be thinking, oh, we have two whole years uh, before that will even take effect. There's no need to think about it yet. Uh, but I encourage you to take advantage of the uh, preliminary notices that were released by the IRS in 2015 and use those notices to uh, begin to evaluate the tax's potential impact on your current plan. And then you might be able to, in a long-term strategy, think about the changes you might want to be making um, over the next two years to the type of medical coverage that you offer. So the IRS did release these notices. Um, they are preliminary, meaning they're subject to change, and the IRS has made it very clear that because they're subject to change, uh, they're not meant for employers to rely on, but they can help us just begin to think about how the tax might play out. So in these notices, there were several items addressed, and the first item addressed was applicable coverage. So what type of coverage is going to potentially be subject to the Cadillac tax? And that is coverage provided under any group health plan, including both employer and employee contributions. And this will affect um, health FSAs, HSAs, retiree coverage. It's going to affect multi-employer plans. Um, so it's a pretty wide net that's being cast here. The IRS also addressed how the cost of the tax will be determined, I'm sorry, how the cost of the coverage will be determined, and then what the dollar limits will be on that coverage. So, Employers will be responsible for determining per employee how much the total cost of coverage um, exceeds established thresholds, if at all. So in 2018, we know that the, the threshold uh, limit for individual coverage is going to be $10,200. And for families, um, it's actually going to be $27,500. So any amount in excess of those thresholds will be subject to a 40% tax. Um, so if you offer really rich medical benefits, um, you might be looking at these thresholds and thinking, gosh, we're easily going to surpass those. And that's why we need to begin thinking about um, this tax now before it actually comes into effect in 2018. So the taxpayers, liable taxpayers, the coverage provider is actually the liable party for any tax owed. And the coverage provider for an insured medical plan is going to be the insurance carrier. So the insurance carrier will be liable for this tax. Um, of course, it will be passed on through to the employer. Um, but the carrier is ultimately the liable taxpayer. But for a self-insured plan, then, that leaves the employer as the coverage provider and the liable party. And then finally, the IRS briefly touched on the payment of the tax, and we know that the payment will be made by either the carrier or the employer, depending upon the insured status of the plan, but the form and the method of the payment um, remains under consideration. They really haven't uh, come up with any um, even general suggested way that this will be reported and then paid um, to the IRS, but they did make clear that the tax will not be deductible. So that is what you are looking at for even beyond 2016. And on that note, I will pass things over to Michelle and, um, and let her discuss the NLRB activities that are of significance going into 2016. 
Thank you, Deborah. Yeah, I'm gonna we're gonna change gears a little bit and talk about the National Labor Relations Board, which traditionally in the past um, has been focused on unions, union activity, the industries that are traditionally union. But over the last couple of years, they've really kind of expanded into any way that employees get together and do what they call concerted activities. So when they're talking about concerted activities, they're talking about when employees self-organize um, for the purposes of collective bargaining or what they call other mutual aid or protection. Um, and so now we're, I'm going to kind of review three cases this year that kind of highlight the ways that they consider employees having now getting together for mutual aid and protection. So in the three cases I'm going to review, it's, none of them are really about union organizing. They're all about employees trying to get together to protect themselves and the way that employers violated the National Labor Relations Act by trying to block them. Um, so the first one is about T-Mobile, huge company all across the U.S. What they were charged with, or a judge ruled, that their employment policies violated U.S. labor law by restricting a worker's ability to organize. And this was in March. And what happened here was that they had overall corporate policies that prevented workers from communicating with each other about their wages, you weren't supposed to talk about your wages, from speaking to the news media about workplace conditions, and from speaking with coworkers um, to collect evidence against disciplinary charges. And what was somewhat interesting about this case was that because the complaints by employees were spread out in all sorts of different jurisdictions, and, and in many of these cases, individual employees had settled with T-Mobile for a financial settlement, what happened was the NLRB got enough complaints that they requested a copy of their policies, of T-Mobile's policies. And one of their judges ruled that their policies violated the NLRA, um, but it wasn't particularly on any case. It was just the policies overall. And so T-Mobile now has to go back to the drawing board, change some of their policies, and make it easier for their employees to work together, again, for mutual aid and, and protection. Um, along that line, there was another case uh, where there was a school, and this was in June, and an NLRB judge ordered this Dalton school to rehire a teacher that had been terminated after sending out an email to his coworkers criticizing the school administrators handling of an issue. So this Dalton school was a performing arts school, and there was an incident about a play um, that the parents, it had some racial overtones, and some of the parents were pushing back, and when all was said and done, many of the teachers involved um, were not happy with the way that the school handled the, the communication with the parents and the way they handled the play. And so this employee sent out an email to his colleagues, not to the administrators, but to his colleagues, complaining and trying to get everybody to kind of work together to go back to the administration and say they should apologize and they should treat these things differently. Um, by the, the gentleman's name was Mr. Brune. By his own you know, admission, his emails were a bit dramatic. He was a drama teacher. Um, but what happened was the, uh, one of his coworkers forwarded on to the administration, um, you know, management at the school, and the administrators called Mr. Brune into a meeting, and they didn't tell him that they had a copy of his email, but they um, they asked him questions about was he criticizing the administration, and um, he he I they didn't really specify what his response was, but in result to that meeting, they terminated his employment, and so an NLRB judge came in and said, no no no, you can't do that. He wasn't particularly criticizing the school to the public. He was trying to talk to his coworkers in the spirit of promoting a frank discussion about the department's grievances. And so they actually, so the NLRB judge said that the school had to to rehire him. Uh, the third one is a, a little more about Facebook. This was this triple play sports bar. Um, in this case, uh, the sports bar terminated some employees who had liked a comment made by a previously terminated employee. Um, but the employee that had been previously terminated had posted a Facebook posting about complaining about the way the sports bar handled um, their taxes, or the way that there was deductions from the payroll and that kind of thing. And a couple of current employees liked that comment. One of the management team members was a friend of somebody on that was on this posting, and so they terminated these other employees. And the NLRB um, ruled against the sports bar, said that no, 
you can't do that because the employees were really trying to, they amounted to the employees discussing labor issues and were not meant to defame the bar or its products. The bar actually appealed that decision and went to a circuit court who agreed with the NLRB that no, again, you can't fire um, employees just for liking something if, again, it's because they're trying to work together to make their working conditions better. So kind of the, the summary to all of that is that the NLRB, which is something that in many cases, you know, those of us who aren't in an industry that would get typically unionized isn't something we necessarily pay attention to. Um, but, you know, they're starting to increase their reach out there. And what they really want to do is make employers understand that employees have a right to complain to each other to try to work together to make their working conditions better. So you need to be careful about terminating employees who, who want to, or discipline employees who, who are doing so. All right, next, if we can uh, go to the next slide. The next one is a, a very big decision um, that affects a lot of employers that do franchises. And in this case, the NLRB greatly expanded what they call their joint employer doctrine. And in fact, they even changed their own stand this year. And so this was in August. And what they did is, in a case called uh, Browning Ferris, this was a recycling plant where um, Browning Ferris had about 60 employees that primarily worked outside of the, the, the recycling facility itself. They did a lot of the delivery, the driving, the administration, and then they had 10 employees through an agency working inside. And the um, Teamsters Union was trying to organize the, the employees of the staffing unit. And so they complained to the NLRB that they should, Browning Ferris and the staffing agency should be joint employers. And somewhat of a surprise, the board ruled in favor of the union and said that, yes, that and the statement below, which I won't go through the whole thing, but basically it's, it's not necessarily that the employer has any direct control over the staffing firm employees, but if they have any sort of shared control, then they can also be held as a joint employer. And so they said things like, although... Um, you know, the staffing firm is responsible for staffing shifts at the facility, the company set the facility's operating hours and productivity standards, therefore they share control. So this is a pretty scary uh, ruling for many franchises. McDonald's is already um, pushing back against this because, you know, if McDonald's as a corporate sets the price and sets the price of things, so therefore those are your profit margins, then, you know, the individual franchisee has to kind of follow the model. And so they're saying shared control. And so this is one to watch. I think there's going to be some more information that comes out about this case. Uh, and then finally, I have a couple, if we can leave the slide one more time. Um, I've just got a couple cases where there has been some employer success. The first one is that the NLRB declined to assert jurisdiction over the unionization effort of football players at Northwestern University. Um, this is a pretty specific case. I doubt there's anybody on the phone here that manages a you know a football team or a school. Um, but what was kind of interesting about this was that the original case started over whether or not these student athletes were um, focused on you know if it, what they did was bringing in compensation, and therefore they should be compensated. And that's what the case was really about. But where the NLRB decided that they shouldn't rule on this case came down to more of jurisdiction. And they said that they would have a hard time um, pursuing, there would be a hard time pursuing any sort of collective bargaining because when you're talking about a, a football league, there's multiple schools and they're being public and private, and they really kind of thought they were going to mess things up if they got, they got into this. And so they, they declined to pursue anything in this area. The other one that was, is good news for employers was that the, um, a court actually reversed a, an NLRB ruling that found that the company Murphy Oil, Oil Soap, um, they, had an arbit they had arbitration agreements, still do arbitration agreements, that bar workers from pursuing class action lawsuits. And so the NLRB at first came out and said, no, that you can't have that. You can't have, because it um, restricts employees' ability to union, or to, or, I'm sorry, to organize, um, or to, to work together. But the court reversed that ruling, say that their arbitration agreements do, in fact, uh, they don't 
um, stop employees from getting together and talk about working conditions. It doesn't um, stop them from getting together to file complaints. But what they can't do is participate in a class action lawsuit. So again, a little specific, but some good news for, for employers. So on that front, I will now turn it back over to Paul, who's going to talk about independent contractor rules. So given our uh, time this morning, thank you, Michelle. Given our time this morning, um, I'm not going to spend a tremendous amount of time on independent contractor rules. Most, uh, we believe most of our listeners know uh, generally uh, about independent contractor versus employee and misclassifications. But the real question that's been in the news a lot this year, and I think is going to be played out in 2016, is does the traditional independent contractor definition really fit with the, quote, new economy? Or is there some sort of an industry disruptor changing the way we think about work? So uh, we've all heard about the Uber case. So this case in, these cases involve Uber, Lyft, Reddit, and a number of the other uh, sort of new economy uh, delivery services in terms of are there workers, independent contractors, or do they need to be employees? Now, the traditional view of independent contractor versus employee, which, by the way, is the view <clears throat> that most investigating agencies are going to apply to or to analyze any uh, classification question, and has to do generally with the right of control and is there an arm's length business relationship and is the service integral to the hosting organization's business. Um, and those are the usual sorts of reviews. And these reviews are stepping up quite a bit. Um, interestingly, uh, our firm had the privilege of getting, having an IRS audit last year and uh, independent contractor relationships were a big issue in the review. Uh, and I'm pleased to say we, we passed without a ch any change to our return. But the Uber argument, this new economy, presents a real interesting new twist on independent contractors. Uh, their argument is that uh, basically both sides are software subscribers, both the Uber driver and the passenger. And all Uber is doing is providing a new type of marketplace for these uh, riders and drivers. Uh, and they're providing a, a software service where um, this platform can operate. Uh, and this offers more choice and flexibility. And you know, as these cases have developed, there's plenty of Uber drivers that are saying, uh, I love it this way. You know, I can turn down work. I work when I want to. I can use my own car. I'm comfortable with the compensation. Uh, and there's plenty of arguments on the other side. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So, um, on the plaintiff's side of the argument um, in the Uber case, uh, the plaintiff's attorney argues, and this is a class action lawsuit, she argues that it's morally wrong to deprive workers of benefits. Um, these would be health benefits, unemployment insurance, workers' comp, et cetera, that, you know, that's just morally wrong to do. And secondly, they're saying that Uber's now got a market valuation of $40 billion, and a company of that size can afford to pay workers as employees. Uh, and then there's uh, ancillary arguments such as uh, the lack of liability. You know, typically in contractor arrangements, the contractor is required to provide some sort of liability insurance. Uh, that insurance would be less on an individual by individual basis than you would find from a large corporation. So uh, I just want to touch briefly on how these misclassification issues can arise and end up uh, blowing up in your face as an employer. Uh, and usually the way they arise in our firm's experience has been that uh, someone who's a contractor today decides he or she would like to be an employee tomorrow because when the relationships end, they can't get unemployment insurance or they're injured and there's no workers' comp available under a contract scenario. Uh, so most of these sorts of issues come up by disgruntled contractors in our experience. Um, a recent webinar I attended, you know, one of the investigating officers said they, they receive, this was the Department of Labor Standards Enforcement here in California, that they receive a lot of tips. And tips could be 
uh, important because, you know, if I'm an employer in industry who's employing my people and paying uh, benefits and roll up taxes and the whole nine yards, and my competitor springs up next door who's got all contractors, that person has a competitive advantage, and if I don't think they're handling it right, um, that's how these tips come up. So there are. I just want to touch upon briefly these key factors in defending yourself. You got to have a clear written agreement. Without a written agreement in California, uh, you don't have a contractor relationship. Um, it should have a one-year term, and it should be renegotiated. And you should keep evidence of this renegotiation. And then the person should receive, the contractor should receive a 1099 and a DE 546, which shows intent by both parties to enter into a contractor relationship. So I just wanted to cover the contractor issues uh, briefly. And then there's sort of the catch-all topic of HR compliance that you're going to look at in 2016. I'd like to turn the floor over to Amy Kellerman. Amy? Thanks, Paul. So what we're going to talk about with sort of the HR compliance past and present is uh, I would like to talk about the 2015 in review, so we're, what they were the key topics in HR in 2015. And we've heard already a lot about healthcare reform. It was much on the mind of HR professionals and um, a lot to sort of manage and wrangle there as those uh, requirements come into play in our daily lives at work. Um, California sick leave was effective July 1st, 2015. Um, it was a major change in sick leave uh, legislation and, and laws that we all have to comply with in the state of California and required an hour of paid sick time for every 30 hours worked for employees. Also, uh, by definition, brought uh, paid sick time to lots of categories of employees who didn't previously have it, like temporary or part-time workers, if they worked enough to qualify for this. Uh, then they were eligible for paid sick time as well. So there, it was amended uh, by AB 304 in, uh, on July 13th, so for the procrastinators who were waiting to uh, put these uh, policies into place, they got a little bit of help at that time with the uh, AB 304. And what that did was it allowed for some slower rates of accrual, and it also addressed things like uh, companies who had unlimited time off policies that they were were allowed to have those unlimited time off policies and those were uh, found to, they were defined as uh, being in compliance with the California sick leave as long as they also met the requirement to put the word unlimited onto people's paychecks or um, other written documents that they receive when they're paid. I wanted to just let everybody know that the uh, Department of Industrial Relations of California has an FAQ that they have, have up for a while, but it's finally been updated with the uh, amended 304 regulations, so that's a surprisingly useful and handy um, resource for uh, managers, employers who are making sure that their policies are in compliance or uh, new businesses that are setting their policies up to just take a look at that. Uh, also, at the same time, this is a trending uh, subject and so not just in California but lots of municipal, city, other states, uh, legislations are coming out around paid sick leave. It's definitely trending and we expect that to continue in the future. Uh, compensation equality has, was a big topic this year. Uh, I w remembered that when I was watching the Oscars this year, the Academy Awards, Patricia Arquette was accepting an Oscar for her work in the movie Boyhood, and she started talking about pay equality and women standing up and asking for equal pay. And uh, sometimes you think, okay, if it were just Patricia Arquette, it might feel a little soapboxy and <laughs> one person giving an Oscar acceptance speech like happens from time to time. And they take that opportunity. But uh, they had a, an amazing shot that panned to Meryl Streep, who uh, jumped out of her chair and raised her fist uh, and, and said, yes, it's amazing that you're talking about this, and really threw her support in there. So I'm going to call that the Meryl Streep effect, and I think that for 2015, we really saw that compensation equality came to the forefront of people's minds. We also had Ellen Powell, uh, her legal case that was early this year where she alleged gender discrimination and retaliation uh, in her position at Kleiner Perkins, which is a large venture capital firm. So that was 
because of the nature of the complaint and the parties involved, it was being almost daily you know, tweeted and blogged about and the, lots of interest in that case and how the ad would come out. She did not end up prevailing in her case, but it brought this topic to the forefront again and just reinforced that this is something that's on people's minds. Um, just recently, we have the Fair Pay Act that has just passed in California. And so, <clears throat> and so this act makes it illegal for an employer to pay any of its employees at a wage rate that is less than the rates paid to employees of the opposite sex for substantially similar work. And it's really around that substantially similar work that major changes are uh, enacted effective January 1st of next year as opposed to the same work or equal work. Um, there's just a broader net uh, cast there around where you compare people and the nature of the work that they're doing. Um, and even in different locations or different job titles, you have to really look at the work that they're doing and make sure that that is um, uh, comparable. And when, but you do still view it in view in um, com as a composite of skills, effort, responsibility, and, and work performed. It also has uh, a requirement that Pro prohibits employers from retaliating against employees who disclose their own wages. Uh, like we heard about before in the presentation, discussion of the wage with others, uh, there is strict requirement to allow people to have those conversations among each other and not retaliate against them for that or for bringing a claim under this new act. Uh, and it also requires um, record keeping of three years, which previously was two years for these kinds of um, uh, details around people's wages and, and uh, decisions about wages. So 2016, um, we're looking ahead and some things that may be ahead. The California minimum wage we know is changing uh, to $10 an hour effective January 1st and there are all kinds of uh, jurisdictions and other cities and states that have their own um, uh, minimum wages and required wages. Uh, federal contractors sometimes have a different required wages so always pay attention to the jurisdictions and the situation of your specific organization. Um, health, fair pay and health care reporting and those are just effective in 2016, so I wanted to mention them here. And then also much in the news and uh, getting email alerts from uh, attorneys about planning for the future, we are seeing a lot about the Department of Labor's potential new overtime rule. Uh, if enacted, it would change the federal threshold for white collar exempt employees from 23,660 per year to um, 50,440 per year. And so that means that employees under this salary threshold could not be exempt from overtime. They would be, uh, couldn't be salaried anymore, they'd have to be paid hourly and paid overtime. Uh, this proposed rule is currently under review and uh, there are great many employees who would be impacted within that range zone, uh, but the DOL is, has received 290,000 comments on it and they're currently reviewing all of those comments. Um, at this point, you know, we're all just staying tuned for any final outcome, which is anticipated to be sometime in 2016 and all of this could change. So um, at this point, it's, it's a little bit early to say what this could mean or make specific plans around it, but um, just stay tuned and find out what the final outcome is on that and, and, and as it uh, evolves, uh, we'll keep everybody posted on that. And with that, I'll pass it back to Ashley. Of course. Thank you, Amy. And seeing that it is close to 11 a.m., I don't think we're going to have much time to field very many questions or any of that. I apologize. Uh, but we want to thank everyone for attending. And as promised in the beginning, we do have a brief bio of each of um, the company's stories, Shared HR as well as Felice. And again, if you are interested in obtaining a copy of this presentation, please contact our offices directly. And we do have all of your questions in the question chat pane, and we will follow up with you directly um, within the next uh, several business days. And for those of you who are interested, here are the presenter's contact information. And again, thank you for attending our 2016 HR Trends webinar.